Down the long path of history, tramping across centuries and continents, and the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. The NBC University of the Air, a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations, presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With Clifton Utley as narrator, we present Chapter 9, the story of Leon Gambetta and the birth of a republic on We Came This Way. For my doll, men make events. Yeah, how? Well, take Washington. If Washington had not come along when he did, there might never have been a United States. What about Lincoln? Same thing. No, no, men don't make events. Events make men. Look at the men we've known in our own time. Hitler, Mussolini, Winston Churchill, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Well, I'll leave it to this fellow here. What do you say? Well... There comes a time in the affairs of men when the fate of millions of people hangs in the balance. It might be said that the crisis was the result of the deeds of certain men. Or again, it might be that the men were the result of the crisis. But this we do know. When great crises face mankind, leaders do rise up and blaze the way for their people to follow. And such an inspired leader was Leon Gambetta. People of Paris were awakened in the early morning hours of December 2nd, 1851, by artillery and rifle fire sweeping the streets. During the night, Louis Napoleon, who was then president, had overthrown the Second Republic with a sudden bold stroke, created the Second Empire, and made himself the emperor. I can hardly believe it. He is mowing down the people in the streets, Dr. Baudin. I talked with him late last night, and there was no hint of this. His soldiers seized the assembly hall first thing, just after midnight. We must arouse the workingmen. Yes, they will stand with us against him. He will arrest us. All of us deputies on site. We must tell the workmen what has happened. We must go out into the streets and tell them the truth. Lead the way, Baudin, and we will follow. Next day, the small party of deputies threw up a barricade in the Faubourg Saint Antoine. Baudin, with the Constitution of the Second Republic in his hands, climbed atop the barricade, which consisted of an overturned omnibus and several carriages. Your rights, the rights of you, the people, have been crushed by the act of this despot, Napoleon III. The troops, Napoleon's troops are coming. We are well armed, Baudin. We cannot retreat. People, your assembly, the members you have elected to represent you under the law, have been dissolved. I ask you to rise. For what? To die to help a member of the assembly like you keep your daily pay of 25 francs? Wait a little and you shall see how a man can die for 25 francs. I hold here in my hand the text of the most precious document of France, the Constitution. Louis Napoleon has destroyed this Constitution, which he has sworn on oath to maintain. Let me read from it. Let me tell you your rights under this Constitution. Baudin fell with three musket bullets in his skull and died there in the street with the Constitution of the Second Republic clutched in his hand. With Baudin died the Second Republic. But the will to be free still lived in many Frenchmen. Seventeen years later, in 1868, three editors in Paris opened a subscription to erect a memorial to Baudin. They were arrested and brought to trial charged with inciting hatred and contempt of Louis Napoleon's government. It is not the editors who are on trial. It is the empire of Louis Napoleon. That is what the discerning one said. And defending one of the editors was a young attorney named Leon Gambetta. Gambetta? Which one is he? I do not know. Perhaps that bulky one there with the beard and one eye. Gambetta? Yes, I have heard the name. Soon, Gambetta's name was to be known to every Frenchman and to people far beyond the seas and would endure for centuries to come. Masterfully, he presented his case. By the time he was ready to make his final plea, 
The people in the courtroom were roused to tense expectancy. Ah, he is not just a man, this Gambetta. He is a force. And he is only 30 years old. 30? He looks 50. It is that beard in his great size. Why have we never heard of him? They say he was born in the South, the son of a grocer. And he has only recently come to the attention of the court. Gambetta fixed the court with his overwhelming presence. Listen! For 17 years now, you have been the absolute discretionary masters of France. It is your own word. We will say nothing of the use you have made of her resources, of her blood, of her honor, and her glory. But there is one fact that is your most complete condemnation. You have never dared to say we will celebrate December 2nd as one of the solemn festivals of France. We will make it a national anniversary. No. And yet all of the regimes that have followed one another in this country have honored the day of their birth. July 14th and August 10th were made festivals. The July days of 1830 the 24th of February. Only two anniversaries, the 18th of Brumaire and December 2nd, have never been raised to the rank of solemn commemoration. For you know that if you try to place them there, they would be rejected by the conscience of the nation. Very well then. We claim this anniversary, which you would not keep. We take it for our own. And we shall celebrate it always, unceasingly. Every year, it will be the anniversary of our dead. Until the country shall once more be master and shall subject you to great national expiation in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Yeah. Ah, Solicitor General, you shrug your shoulders. Do not imagine that I am afraid either of your scorn or your threats. Yesterday, at the close of your address, you said, we shall take precautions. Do you, Solicitor General, dare to say you will take measures? What measures will you take? Is that not a threat? Well, then, listen. This is my last word. You can strike us, but you can never dishonor us now beat us down! <laughs> Gambetta lost the case, but he had sounded the death knell of Louis Napoleon's empire. He had rallied the flagging hopes of the Republicans. Overnight, he became famous, and for the next 14 years, all Europe was to resound with his name. Be the Gambetta! <laughs> the Republicans had found a champion, a dynamic, eloquent, fearless champion. The next year, 1869, he was elected to the Chamber of Deputies, and Louis Adolphe Thiers immediately saw his value. The very fact he was elected establishes him as a symbol of justice in France. But now France was facing war. Bismarck was in power in Prussia. He is trying to provoke war with France, Monsieur Thiers. Yes, and the Chamber of Deputies is playing into his hands. You and I alone, Monsieur Thiers, of all our parties, stand against war with Prussia. Yeah, the question is, can we prevail? Sooner or later, war must come. But we must not permit Bismarck to provoke us into it. France must clearly be proved to be just in the eyes of the world. Then we shall have the support of the world against the Prussians. In Paris, the mobs railed against the insults of Bismarck. But in the provinces where Gambetta had come from, there was no clamor for war. But on July 19th, 1870, it came. And as vigorously as he had opposed war, he now supported it. We shall beat them! We shall beat them! Emperor Louis Napoleon and Marshal MacMahon were mar marching on chalons en sedan and one of France's two armies. In Paris, Gambetta was working with infectious enthusiasm. We shall beat them! We shall beat them! On September 1st, 1870, word came back to Paris that Louis Napoleon and Marshal MacMahon and their army had made contact with the Prussians, and a battle was underway at Sedan. The next day, the news of what had happened struck Paris and the Chamber of Deputies like a thunderbolt. Prussians have crushed us at Sedan. 
Louis Napoleon and Marshal MacMahon, and one of France's two armies have been captured. While the Chamber of Deputies sat in session, the crowds in the streets went wild with excitement. The mobs are gathering in the approaches to the building. The empire of Louis Napoleon was tottering. The emperor was a captive. And one of his marshals and one of his armies were captives. Jules Favre and Thierry and other strong men of the Chamber of Deputies made proposals. The time has come to overthrow Louis Napoleon and his entire dynasty. We must convoke a constituent assembly. We must set up a provisional governing commission. Stand back there. Stand back behind that grill. The cable is in session. Stand back there. The street mobs are broken down the grill and they're pouring into the gallery. My people! My people! My people! The first condition of the people's emancipation is order. I know you are resolved to respect it. Gambetta addressed the people in the gallery. You desire to give an energetic expression to your wishes. Your wish is in the depths of every Frenchman's heart. It is on the lips of your country. We want a republic! We want a republic! My people! My people, pray be calm. Order must be preserved. We have two things to do. First, to resume our sitting and act in accordance with authorized forms. And second, to give the country an example of real union. I am with Napoleon. We want a republic. There is a solemn pledge. There is a solemn pledge that you must give us. That you will allow us to deliberate in perfect freedom. Help! Help! They're trying to break down the door and it's okay, but... Get back! Get back! Stay out here! The howling mob swarmed into the chamber like a tidal wave. Gambetta stood like a rock against them. In the name of France, you must be calm. Have you no confidence in us, your elected representatives? Yes, yes, we have confidence in you. But what about the Republic? Citizens, citizens, listen to me. Since the country is in danger, since sufficient time has been given the representatives of the nation to depose the dynasty of Louis Napoleon, since we here constitute the authority sanctioned by your popular vote, we here and now declare that Louis Napoleon and his dynasty have forever ceased to reign over France. The empire was ended. Gambetta and the leaders of the deputies, with the people of Paris cheering and shouting around them, walked to the Hotel de Ville. And there, Gambetta proclaimed the Republic, the government of national defense, and he became Minister of the Interior in it. Louis Adolphe Thiers became president. And it was to him that Gambetta went with the plea that the government move away from the imminent danger of capture by the Prussians. Let us be realistic, Monsieur Thiers. The Prussians are advancing on Paris. It is questionable that we can hold Paris, but we can win. Monsieur Gambetta, if we leave Paris, there will be revolution. The government must stay. But there is need in tour for a member of the government of your capacity, Monsieur Gambetta. The government asks that you, as Minister of the Interior, go. No. I feel strongly that the government should move. But if it stays here in Paris then I should be here. Paris is the post of the greatest danger and therefore of the greatest honor. I shall stay. But, Monsieur Gambetta, it is of the greatest importance to the government that you go to... to... The members of the government argued with Gambetta for days. One of France's armies had been captured at Sedan. The second, surrounded at Metz. Yet no thought that France could lose the war ever entered Gambetta's head. It was not until Paris was completely surrounded by Prussians that he would agree to leave for tour to carry on the fight. But uh, how will you get out now? I will get out. On October 7th, 1870, Gambetta with an undersecretary and a pilot climbed into a balloon at the Place Saint-Pierre at Montmartre. Are you ready, Monsieur Gambetta? I am. Hold on. Cast off the line. Cast off the line. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. The balloon rose quickly from the field. The breeze is southeasterly. That will carry us over the line of Prussian forts, will it not, pilot? Yes, it will. It does not matter. The balloon rose to an altitude of 2,000 feet. The Prussian advance guard is firing at us, Monsieur Gambet. Yes, with artillery. Hear those shots whistling by us? Yes. Can we rise higher, pilot? A little. They rose out of range of the cannon. Then suddenly, something went wrong. We're beginning to come down. What has happened, pilot? I don't know. 
We're going to land. But it's not this territory in the hands of the Prussians. But there's no way to stay up. Hold on. The balloon landed in a field, which only a few hours before had been occupied by enemy regiments. Quickly. Prussian troops, seeing them, rushed for the balloon. Quickly. Get this ballast overboard. Yes. Ah, they are rising again. Look. Look, they're aiming their rifles at us. The balloon rose to 600 feet. Gambetta was grazed on the hand by a musket ball. Is it bad, Monsieur Gambetta? No. Can't we keep this attitude, pilot? For a while, at least. Skimming over the treetops, the balloon stayed aloft until they reached Montdidier. Gambetta made his way to Amiens, and from there to Tours. Gambetta's daring fired the imagination of the people, inspired them to continue the fight, although now France's second army, besieged at Metz, had surrendered. We can still win. We will make this a war to the finish. War to the finish! Yes, war to the finish! War to the end! No, no, they have captured both our armies. They have captured our marshals. What can we do? We will raise a new army, and we will fight the Bosch and beat them. Yeah. In Tour, Gambetta became the Minister of War as well as the Minister of the Interior. The people rallied around him. With Monsieur de Freysenet, a brilliant young engineer, Gambetta organized the resistance of the provinces against the invading Prussians. Not only must we raise an army de Freysenet, but we must find generals. We will find generals. Inspired with the spirit of freedom, the two worked together, de Freysenet working out the details and Gambetta stirring the hearts of his people with his glowing eloquence. Let us sink all individual interests. Let us sacrifice all personal sentiments to the one thought, the salvation of France. Then we shall beat back the enemy. France will be saved, and the Republic will be permanently established. Out of thin air, under the commanding leadership of Gambetta and de Freysenet, a new French army materialized. Monsieur Gambetta. Monsieur Gambetta. Yes, what is it? We've defeated them at Coulmier. The dispatch has just come. Ah, we have turned the tide. We will beat them. We will beat them. We have raised an army of 600,000. But the crushing power of the Prussians is drawing in on Paris. If Paris can hold out, we shall be able to lift the siege. We have made a start of Freysenet. And now we shall win. Paris was in the grip of the enemy. But under the direction of Gambetta, most of the rest of France was still resisting. Paris has capitulated. What? Yes. The government surrendered yesterday. It is impossible. France cannot capitulate. We will continue the fight. Can we continue? After the government in Paris has... By what presumption does Paris dare to surrender for the provinces? Paris is not France. No. We will continue the fight. We will fight to the finish. We will beat them. The Prussians were in Paris. But Gambetta, in the provinces, raising and organizing and equipping and training his army of liberation, would not yield. At length, Jules Favre, vice president, came from Paris to prevail upon him. If you love France, you will yield. If you do not yield, there will be civil war. Alone, without allies, without leaders, deprived of communication with their capital, Gambetta's army of the Republic had resisted five months against a powerful enemy which the regular armies of the French Empire had not been able to hold back for five weeks. Gambetta gave in. Monsieur Gambetta, you are ill. France has fallen. You must care for your health now while there is still time. France has fallen. It is impossible. Gambetta had all but spent himself. He resigned and went to San Sebastian in Spain to fight for his health. And now the people of Paris, penniless and hungry, many among them disarmed French soldiers, stood by and watched the Prussians march in. For this, we have to thank our government. And now the government is coming to sit at Versailles. Adolf Thiers and his lick spittles are coming to sit at Versailles. Uh, I heard it today. Never. Adolf Thiers is sympathetic to the return of the monarchy. Never will France have another Louis XIV. We must see to it that Adolf Thiers and his assembly never have the opportunity to... Adolf Thiers, in February 1871, had been elected by the National Assembly as... Chief of the Executive Power of the French Republic. The Assembly was to convene at Versailles on March 20th. But two days before that, the Commune broke out. We demand the arrest and trial of the members of the Government of National Defense. Bring to justice those responsible for the dishonor of France. The rank and file became a lawless mob. The newly created Republic, born through bloodshed and suffering and national disaster, balanced on the brink of destruction. Troops were sent to seize the guns of Montmartre and to put down the riot. In the name of the Republic, I demand that you give up your guns and disperse. Surround the troops. Surround the troops. Take the firearms from the soldiers. We will need them. Fire at the revolutionaries. Fire! Instead of firing on the communards, the soldiers joined them and arrested their own commander. In the name of the Republic, I demand that you... The commander fell. 
riddled with bullets. The army forces of Paris were in rebellion against the government. The riot spread to Lyon, to Narbonne, Toulouse, Limoges, to Marseille. Liberty! Justice! The Prussians stood by and watched Frenchmen killing Frenchmen. The fighting went on for two months until Paris had to be besieged once again, and again conquered by force of arms. Gambetta was ill in Spain. He had fought for the Republic against the Empire. He had fought for the Republic against the enemy. Now the Republic fa faced what Gambetta dreaded most, destruction by its enemies within France. I will try to restore the monarchy. No, the monarchy must not be restored. Gambetta returned to France, was elected by ten departments as deputy. Now his task was to save the Republic. But against him were the powerful royalists. You dare speak of a republic? Three times a republic has been tried in France. And three times it has perished in blood and imbecility. The very word republic strikes terror in the heart of all who love France. I say to you that a republic is the hope of France. There can be no peace and no order until our classes shall have been given a share in the benefits of civilization and can regard the government as the legitimate offspring of the sovereign power of the people. The Republic means placing public affairs into the hands of fanatics ready for any violence. I ask Monsieur Gambetta what our republics recall. The First Republic recalls the reign of terror. The Second Republic recalls the bloody June insurrection. And the Third Republic recalls more brutally than we can ever forget the bloody and disgraceful commune. The Republic stands indicted before the world. <laughs> Citizens, does France desire to forswear her right to constitute herself a free country? If there is anything to console us amid the sorrow and the shame of our bereaved country, it is the thought that the mothers and patriots of France will supply her future champions and avengers. We must establish once and for all a government founded on that equality of rights and duties which recognizes no other distinctions between man and man than those arising from character, intelligence, and energy in the battle of life. A republic? Yes! I call upon all parties and the masses who are of no party to support the republic. And I ask you, do you wish to rule the Republic? Then recognize it first. When you have recognized it, then we shall be perfectly ready to admit you to the conduct of its affairs. The Republic was saved, but only for the time. Gambetta became the defender of the young Republic against all who threatened it. Vigilantly, he guarded against all reactionaries, against both royalists and imperialists. He watched the fall of the government of Louis Adolphe Thiers. The rise to power of Marshal MacMahon, who in 1870 had been captured with the first French army and with Louis Napoleon at Sedan. When President MacMahon undertook a coup d'etat to turn the Republic over to the Royalists, Gambetta squarely opposed him. What kind of Republic do we have when a president can dissolve a legislative body like the Chamber of Deputies? Because it is Republican, and he is a sympathizer with the Royalists and the Imperialists. We have a Senate and a Chamber of Deputies to preclude the very thing that President MacMahon is trying to do. Yes. But the Senate is anti-Republican. But the Chamber of Deputies is not. No. But it is too late to stop the President from dissolving the Chamber. That he has already done. His plot is to elect a new Chamber of Deputies, which is anti-Republican. And with both houses anti-Republican, and with a reactionary President like McMahon, and his reactionary ministry, the Third Republic today faces its gravest crisis since it was born in the blood of 1870. What can we do, Monsieur Gambetta? We can oppose President McMahon. And that... We will do! I say, I say let us take our places on the legal ramparts of our Constitution and fight with all that is in us. MacMahon must not succeed! The 363 Republicans of the dissolved Chamber of Deputies united to support the re-election of one another. They gave charge of their campaign to a committee of 18 under the inspired leadership of Gambetta. When the sovereign voice of France has spoken, they will have to give in or give up. That is Lee's majesty. You are speaking of the head of the French government. Gambetta was arrested, tried, 
sentenced by default to three months' imprisonment and a fine of 2,000 francs. We should never have arrested Gambetta. The trial and sentence have done President McMahon's government as much harm as Gambetta's speech did. Gambetta will not have to serve the sentence. But the damage was done. Gambetta and his committee toured the nation and told the people in what jeopardy the Republic stood because of McMahon's attempt at usurpation of power. The Republicans win! The Republicans win! We have won back control of the Chamber of Deputies! A tyrant can turn us out! But we have been returned by the people! The Republicans again had control of the Chamber of Deputies. Their power was growing. In the next few months, the Republicans also won control of the Senate, which McMahon had tried to use as an instrument against the Republic. McMahon's effort to overthrow the Republic had failed. And with a year still to go in his term, McMahon resigned. The Republic of France, at last, is in the hands of the Republicans. The man who spoke these words was soon to pass forever. But Gambetta was to live on as one of the makers of the French Republic and as a symbol of liberty and of justice for all men, for all time. Would you like to know more of the life and times of Leon Gambetta portrayed in the program you just heard or other men like Tolstoy, Hugo, and Whitman? A handbook containing life stories of 13 great leaders in the struggle for human liberty has been prepared as an interesting supplement to the broadcast series. To obtain your copy, write for We Came This Way. Address your requests to Columbia University Press, Station J, New York 27, and enclose 25 cents in coin to cover costs of printing and mailing. Tonight's script was written by Arnold Marquis and was directed by Norman Felton. Original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and directed by Joseph Galicchio. Clifton Utley was the narrator and Gambetta was played by Murray Forbes. Others in the cast were Ralph Camargo, Art Seltzer, Ronald Van Arsdale, Jim Goss, Sidney Mason, Carl Cronkey, Charles Eggleston, Sidney Brees, and Gilbert Ferguson. This series is presented each week as a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations.